For respiratory physiology, we're going to take a look first at the mechanics of breathing, which is chapter 17 in your textbook. And then we're going to take a look at gas exchange, which is then chapter 18 in your textbook. So first about this chapter, uh, we're going to take a look at the anatomy of the respiratory system, the gas laws, and then ventilation. And as you're using a spirometer, and that's part of the lab as well. So the respiratory system functions, mostly we're talking here about gas exchange between atmosphere and the blood, and then later, of course, between the blood and the tissues. Uh, very important function of the respiratory system is also the pH homeostasis. Uh, your blood pH, for example, needs to be very narrowly regulated, right around 7.4 on the pH scale, and um, your respiratory system does most of the job. Uh, you also, the, another function of the respiratory system would be protection from inhaled pathogens, also any irritating substances that you need to cough out, and then vocalization, so speech. You have vocal cords that help you produce speech. Uh, so let's take a look at the respiratory system bulk flow. Um, basically, it works like the weather, um, where you have the wind flow from the area of high pressure to the area of low pressure, and the same is true for your lungs. Uh, air will be sucked into your lungs when you create a low pressure system and the pressure is higher on the outside and the air will be sucked in. If the pressure is greater on the inside of your lungs as opposed to the outside, then you're pushing air out. Um, you will need to be able to create these pressure gradients and so you have a muscular pump to do that for you. Uh, the resistance to flow is minimal actually in the airways unless you have obstruction and it largely de depends on the diameter of the tubes which are very large in the case of the respiratory system. So here a summary of external respiration. Basically external respiration is the gas exchange between the lungs and the blood. So right here the alveoli of the lungs and then the um, the blood flow right here. So the direction of these gases is that CO2 will move from the blood into the alveoli and oxygen will move from the alveoli into the blood. Let's take a look at the components of the respiratory system. So first up we have the conducting system or the airways and that's on the pathway that the air needs to take on its way in or out. And then we have the alveoli, those are these terminal air sacs where the gas exchange takes place. And then we have sort of the accessory system uh, that contains composed of the bones, muscles of the thorax and the abdomen. So here will be anatomy review. Uh, here you have your upper respiratory tract, so the upper respiratory system here from the nasal cavity, larynx, um, all the way sort of the esophagus. So just there at the junction to the trachea, that's when we start the lower respiratory tract, and that will be the trachea, tracheal, the uh, bronchial tree, and the, um, the actual lungs, then the lung tissue with the alveoli. So the muscles that help you breathe or achieve these differences in pressure, um, very importantly, we have the diaphragm, and you will see how important that is. Uh, of course, the diaphragm sits uh, down here, sort of, it's kind of hidden in here, but the diaphragm is sort of this dome-shaped thing down here. And then the intercoastal muscles play a role. And so we have external and internal intercoastal muscles, and then the sternocleidomastoid up in your neck. Uh, you can feel the sternocleidomastoid muscle contract when you take a very deep breath in. Just feel that in your neck, how those muscles start contracting. Here is an anatomy picture of the lungs and the thoracic cavity. And um, you have the lobes, um, that you probably learned that in anatomy, so you can review that. And then here would be um, the larynx, the trachea, um, so the upper respiratory tract, and then we're branching off into the main bronchial tree with some primary, secondary um, bronchus, and then bronchioles, and then finally we arrive at the alveoli where the actual gas exchange and the actual physiology takes place. So here, the branching of the airways. Uh, physiology is mostly concerned here what's happened at the level of the alveoli. 
Um, we don't really are too concerned about what exact diameter all of this is. Of course, uh, you have the cartilage that makes sure that your trachea doesn't collapse and that this um, very large conducting airway is uh, open for gas exchange and transport of gases. Um, as, your, as the air from the outside enters your body, you need to condition the air. Uh, one of that, that means that you need to warm the air to body temperature. You also need to add water vapor up to a point of 100% saturation with water vapor. And you need to filter out any foreign material like dust particles or any bacteria. So here is sort of the lining of the respiratory tract that helps you achieve that. We have what's called the ciliary escalator. Um, that here, this here is your respiratory epithelium. And then you have all these cilia, these hair like extensions here on these cells. By the way, this here would be a goblet cell that produces mucus, so secreting mucus. And then as dust particles are being trapped in here, then you mix it with some mucus, you trap it and you transport it up and cough it out. That's the ciliary escalator. Now here would be the movement of fluids in the um, airway epithelium. And there's a very important ion channel. In this case, it's a chloride channel. And that is um, taking care of a lot of water movement. And it's basically indirect. With the salt goes the water. That's always That was always our notion. Now, when we are moving chloride ions, then sort of as a secondary result, you get the move of some other ions. So um, these, this chloride channel here, I'm emphasizing it. This is um, CF. This one is called CFTR, and the CFTR stands for uh, Cystic Fibrosis Transmembrane Conductance Regulator. So it's a chloride channel, and it allows chloride ions to go into the lumen of your airways. Now, as a result of this movement, you get a bunch of other move, uh, movement of ions, namely potassium and sodium. And then you also get the movement of water and sodium here across this. People that have a mutation in this channel, in the CFTR channel, they have cystic fibrosis. That means now your chloride transport is isn't right and with the chloride transport as a secondary result the water transport isn't right and what happens is that the mucus that builds up in their airways is way too sticky doesn't have enough water and so the air particles that's the stuff that was uh, trapped from the air it still gets trapped but it doesn't get removed but it's because the um the mucus is way too sticky and it layers up in the respiratory tract and it actually becomes a breeding ground then for these bacteria. And so then these people have multiple lung infections all the time. They have pneumonia all the time. And um, so, um, and it's all because of a mutation in this chloride channel and flawed movement of chloride across this epithelium right here. Okay, so moving on here to some other th uh, things. Uh, mostly here, the uh, structure of the lung lobules. So if you want to take a look at this here, down here we have the alveoli where the actual gas exchange takes place. Very thin um, epithelium right here in the lungs and the alveoli lining the alveoli so that you have minimal distance across. And then each one of these um, alveoli is basically surrounded with elastic fibers and then also capillary beds surrounding each alveolus for maximum gas exchange. If you're taking a look at the inside of the of an alveolus, you will see these very flattened epithelial cells. I'm, I'm outlining here one of them. Uh, it's the nucleus, of course, of one of them. So very flat epithelium. You want to keep the diffusion distance from here to here across at a minimum because these gases are supposed to move to simply down a concentration gradient by diffusion. And um, a larger distance, of course, uh, would, would not help. Here would be a capillary surrounding an alveolus, another capillary right here. And let me point out the type 1 and type 2 alveolar cells. Type 1 alveolar cells, um, they are a bit the, sort of the ground, um, the, the, the ground substance or the cells that are making up the alveoli. So these are cells for gas exchange. Now the type 2 alveolar cells, they produce surfactant. 
um, this one of them right here. A surfactant is basically a soapy material that helps to um, minimize friction. So if you don't have this uh, soapy material, the surfactant, then the sliding of tissues past one another as the thoracic cavity expands and then contracts, it would be very laborious and would hurt. So you want to make sure that this movement of these tissues, um, sheets of tissues past one another is very smooth. And for that, um, you want to have some surfactant. The way you should picture this is um, think of saran wrap. And if you have two pieces of saran wrap and you put them together, they don't want to pa slide past one another. They're very thin pieces of plastic and they would just crumble up and just kind of stick to each other. If you were to put some soap or some diluted soap between the sheets of plastic, between the saran wrap sheets, then all of a sudden the sliding of these sheets of plastic past one another would be very easy. And that's the job of this type 2 alveolar cells that are making the surfactant and make it easier for these tissue uh, sheets to slide past one another as we breathe. Okay, so here exchange across the surface of an alveolus. You want to make sure that you have a minimal diffusion distance. So here this would be, um, here we're going from the alveolar airspace right here and we need to go into the plasma of the blood. Here's a red blood cell, really big. And you can see that the diffusion distance here is only about a micrometer or so in thickness. Okay. very quick review of the pulmonary circulation. Um, once the uh, venous return, so through the vena uh, superior and inferior vena cava returns to the right ventricle, then we're going out from the right side of the heart, the right ventricle, we're going through the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries, lungs where the gas exchange takes place. We're coming back to the left side of the heart via pulmonary veins, left atrium, left ventricle, and then out through the air water. Now let's take a look at some of the gas laws. Uh, for Dalton's law, the only thing I want you to know is that the, the total pressure of a gas is made up of the sum of all the partial pressures. So what you see here is that the partial pressure or the component of oxygen in the air that we inhale is 21% or 160 millimeters of the mercury. Carbon dioxide, 0.25 millimeters of the mercury. Water vapor in the inhaled air, zero. And um, once you're adding up the um, uh, other components, uh, which would be nitrogen and um, some noble gases too, but um, so if you're adding up all the partial pressures of each gas that makes up a mixture of gases, then you would end up with, in this case, one atmosphere, atmosphere. so the atmospheric gases of 760 millimeters of the mercury, they're composed of oxygen at about 21%, and then nitrogen is about 78%, and the remaining 1% is shared among some water vapor, carbon dioxide, and some noble gases. But anyway, so the important thing about Dalton's law is that the um, total, the one atmospheric pressure is made up of the partial pressures of all the gases that are participating in this mixture of gases. Boyle's law is not super important for you guys. There's a relationship between um, the pressure and volume. Of course, if you are pressing down here, then um, the concentration of the gas would be higher. And here is a spirometer. This is the kind of experiment that we were doing in the lab this week. Uh, you're basically exhaling through a tube. This is a really old style spirometer. But either way, what you're measuring here would be tidal volumes as you're breathing in and out and in and out. You're measuring tidal volumes of about a half a liter. So that was all part of the lab. And um, let's conclude this first part right here with a spirogram. What you would be seeing is um, there here is your tidal breathing up and down and that is this tidal volume is 500 milliliters and then here you have if you are exhaling above and beyond a normal tidal breath out and you have the expiratory reserve volume of about 1100 milliliters if you are inhaling above and beyond a 
tidal breath where you just inhale, so you're starting here, then you still have room. That's the inspiratory reserve. And we're going to continue the rest on the next recording.